Welcome back to Vell, Ohio, and we are indoors today for one reason, it's raining outside, but for more important reasons, it's because I have a race tomorrow and I'm just giving my legs a little bit of a rest. I am currently in the grace period in between kind of the first half of the season of the Ohio Gravel Race Series and the second half. So I'm fresh off the heels of the Funk Bottoms Gravel Grinder 200K, which of course is more like 215K, but after 11 hours of riding, who's counting? Uh, I'm really happy with the results of that race, and based on the results, it has bumped me up from, I forget if I was like 16th place, now I'm in 7th place overall in the Ohio Gravel Race Series. Pretty proud of those results, and I hope that I can just keep climbing the ladder, maybe even find myself on the podium. Uh, in these past few weeks, it's given me the chance to reflect on my bike setup and if there are any other optimizations to be made. So far, I'm really happy with my tire selection, high volume, fast rolling. I love my gear uh, ratio so that I can go fast when I need to go fast, but also just kind of crank and winch myself along those 16, 17% climbs. One thing that I hadn't considered before was how much fatigue could play a factor in my overall speed and finishing time. Roughly 100 miles or so into funk bottoms, I just felt so beat up that I thought, even if I had on paper a slower bike, if I just felt fresher at this moment, I would be going faster. Maybe that only matters in races that are over 100 miles of gravel, but I think that there's a level of overall body fatigue within your arms and shoulders and core, low back, that is probably playing a role even in these quote unquote shorter 50 to 60 mile gravel races that I'll still have uh, upcoming in the season. Also later on in the season, we have two races that involve roughly 10 to 30% of the course being on single track. So all this leads to me considering should I make the jump to uh, some sort of front suspension system on my gravel bike. There are a few things to consider when looking at a front suspension for a gravel bike and there are only a couple real options out there for suspension forks for a dedicated gravel bike. The traditional telescoping fork, Rudy has one, Suntour has one, and I believe Fox has one available from 30 to 60 millimeters of travel, which is really only half of what you'd find even on the shortest of cross-country mountain bike uh, forks. You don't really make your decision based off of how much travel they have, but the measurement of the axle to the crown. So literally the axle that the axle is going through the wheel at the bottom of the fork up into the crown of the fork, because you're adding in, let's say 50 millimeters of suspension, that fork might be 40 to 50 millimeters longer than the current rigid suspension fork that you would currently have on your gravel or cyclocross bike. The implication of having a longer fork like that is that it's pretty much going to bring up the front of your bike. It will slacken your head tube angle and it will also raise your bottom bracket. So you don't necessarily want to be higher off the ground for gravel. You want to feel like you're low and planted. Now, increasing your head tube angle and increasing your trail might be a good thing. I know that's something that some people do to their cross-country bike to make it more of an all-mountain or trail bike, uh, putting on a longer suspension fork, giving more trail to the bike. However, as you recall from my previous video, I do have a Works Components headset that has already increased my trail really to what I believe is an ideal uh, figure for the type of descending that we're doing for gravel. So I wanted to avoid that. I wanted to land on a suspension system that would have very minimal impact to my trail figure by having a very similar axle to crown measurement. So the fork that fits the bill is this one. Whoa, <laughs> thanks. Uh, this would be the Lauf Grit SL fork, and yes, it is unlike anything that you've ever seen before, unless of course you've seen a Lauf Grit SL fork. I say SL because really what this is, is Lauf just put out their third generation grit fork, and this happens to be the second gener generation. I've had my eye on one of these for a long time. I just never quite felt justified to purchase one, already running a 2.1 inch tire. I just thought, who needs extra suspension? Um, so thank you to the Funk Masters because you guys have convinced me that some front suspension on my gravel bike might actually be not only more comfortable, but actually advantageous for my racing speed. 
I finally got the chance to ride one of these forks when there was an, an ambassador from Lauf at the uh, Black Fork Gravel Grinder earlier on, on this year, and I was actually pretty surprised how well this just smooths out the chatter of these uh, low impact hits that you would tend to find in gravel. So what sets this fork apart besides its kind of UFO looking appearance from a, a typical telescoping fork? So obviously there is no telescoping aspect to it. You've got your steerer tube that's running into your traditional fork blades. And then what you have is basically a set of floating fork blades that are connected by two levels of three S2 glass fiber uh, leaf springs. And that's actually where the axle is located. That's where your wheel is going to attach to the floating of the two fork blades. One distinction to be made here is that these S2 glass fiber leaf springs are not carbon fiber. They are specifically glass fiber. You're looking for an optimal amount of flex. Carbon fiber would be too hard and too brittle to actually provide enough movement to give you the adequate amount of suspension that you're looking for. Another key difference between this fork and a traditional telescoping fork would be the weight. So with the compression plug, with the little adapter that I have for running the uh, post mount style of uh, brake caliper that I use, and with the through axle, this comes in at under 1,000 grams. S stripping those parts away, it's about 850 grams. We can get a weight on my fully rigid Van Dessel fork, but I think this is only gonna weigh about 200 to 300 grams uh, more than my uh, rigid fork. To put that into perspective, the Suntour GVX gravel-specific telescoping fork with about 40 millimeters of travel would weigh double uh, the weight of this fork. Now, while weight isn't everything when you're traveling in a straight line, when you are trying to maneuver the front wheel, if you do ever have to lift the front of the bike at all as you're you know, avoiding ruts and big potholes on gravel descents, you will notice that weight when trying to elevate the front wheel. Referring back to that axle to crown measurement, the axle to crown measurement on this fork is 411 millimeters, including the six millimeters of sag that you'll get just by placing your hands on the handlebars. The axle to crown on my current fork is 400 millimeters, so you're looking at basically one centimeter raise uh, in the front of the bike, which is gonna be fairly negligible. I would rather have it be a little bit longer as well, because as we start to talk about the 30 millimeters of available travel on this, you don't wanna have that axle to crown uh, measurement dynamically go way below 400. So subtracting so, 30 millimeters from that 411 millimeter axle to crown is only gonna put you a little bit lower than the 400 millimeter typical axle to crown uh, measurement on my fully rigid fork. So besides the aspects of comfort that we've already talked about, why would you want a suspension fork on your bike in the first place? Why are they so ever present on mountain bikes? The function of your front fork is to keep your front tire in contact with the road when you're encountering bumps and obstacles and drops and such so that you maintain your steering traction and your braking traction. In order to do that effectively over large bumps and hits, mountain bikes will have an air chamber on one side with hydraulics on the other side. What they're looking to achieve is to control the rate of compression and to control the rate of rebound. That's what's known as damping and fine tuning your damping based on your road conditions or off-road conditions plus your body weight and just your overall riding style will result in being able to go over a large obstacle, getting the wheel and tire out of the way and then bringing it back down to the ground so that you can maintain uh, contact the entire time. This is clearly an undamped system and that really is what makes it appropriate for gravel uh, in the first place. So unlike on a mountain bike, which would have at bare minimum about 100 millimeters of travel on your XC bike, or maybe 160 millimeters of travel on an enduro bike, this Lauf Grit SL gives you 30 millimeters of travel. Now that doesn't sound like much, but that's actually the intention of the fork, not a limitation. Because of the type of obstacles that you're likely to encounter in a race like Black Fork or Funk Bottoms, what you wanna have is the ability to move up and over very high frequency, very high rate, small obstacles. Because there is no damping within this system, uh, that rate at which the spring moves out of the way, it will return extremely quickly to basically float you over small and frequent imperfections in the road. 
no amount of fine tuning in the rebound and the compression on a 100 millimeter suspension telescoping fork is going to be able to give you the same result. Now, of course, that means this will have limitations if you're trying to take it off-road onto gnarly single track, but since we're gonna spend 80% of our riding time on gravel, I believe that this is a great option for me in the Ohio Gravel Race Series. Now, even though this is an undamped system, these springs are actually progressive, so it will give you a little bit of give with less force in the beginning of the compression cycle, and then it will take more force toward the end of the compression cycle to actually get it to bottom out. So, if you're still awake, if I haven't bored you to tears yet, let's try to get this on my Van Dessel ADD, see how it looks and see how it functions. I hope you all can hear me a little bit better today. At the behest of a lot of my viewers, I actually do have a Rode Video Micro uh, 2 on my GoPro today, so hopefully the volume is a little bit better for you all. Now one implication of actually moving on to this fork is that I'm forced into modernizing my wheel sets. So on my road and cyclocross wheel set, and then even on my 27.5 650B uh, gravel or kind of mountain bike wheel set, I do have to utilize a 15 millimeter through axle. So we're gonna swap out the end caps uh, on this set of prime wheels. And then I'm waiting in the mail for a uh, 15 millimeter to 12 millimeter through axle adapter. The Grid SL, I did purchase one that comes in uh, 12 millimeter, even though you can buy one that's 15, because really that's the axle standard that the industry has converged towards. So if I ever did want to upgrade my wheels someday, it's just better off that I've got the 12 millimeter through axle at this point. I just threw my fully rigid fork onto the scales, uh, coming in at 518 grams, so you are giving up just over 300 grams in weight uh, to move into the, the left grit, which I think is actually really pretty impressive. That's not much additional weight to give you uh, significantly more capability. The other thing you can see here is that the steer tube on the Lauf is just a bit longer, maybe three quarters of an inch, when I bought this frame used, I was a little bit shocked to see just how short that the steer tube had been cut. It works for my fit position actually perfectly, but I've got no versatility to move the bars higher. For some of these courses that involve single track, I do think it would be convenient just to set the bars up higher so that when you're in the drops, you know, with good control in the brakes, that that drop bar position is actually a usable position and you're not down way too low with too much weight over the front tire. So I think I am gonna utilize the full length of this steer tube. Fly so high, I'm hypnotized. What's up is down, what's left is right. Chasing stars and holding you. So with the one centimeter and the five millimeter spacer here, I have just added 15 millimeters of stack to the bike. I'm probably not going to keep it like that on a regular basis unless I'm just primarily going to be doing, you know, off-road single track. But the reason I'm going to do that for now is that removing the brake, I'm going to need uh, more brake hose and uh, uh, brake cable in order to reach the new location of the brake. I'm going to cut new cable anyway um, and cut a new hose. So I'm just going to have it as long as necessary when it is raised up to that maximal stack position. So I have run into a little bit of a hiccup here, um, which is what happens when you do your own work and you don't quite know what you're in for. So as it turns out, this fork did come equipped with a flat to post mount adapter, which is what I need because my uh, Juintec, are these the R ones? The GTs, um, they are kind of the older post mount standard, which is what was compatible with my original Van Dessel fork. So since I bought this used, I did look for one that came with the adapter. However, because this has the adapter, I no longer need a little bracket to go from the 140 to 160 millimeter rotor size. This is just gonna fit right on there 
um, straight away. So the bolts that I used to use are now too long. They're about 30 millimeters long. I do have some 15 millimeter bolts hanging around that could just barely get the job done, but I'm gonna run down to the hardware store and grab some 20 millimeter bolts. So I don't know if we'll pick this up today, but it'll be like studio magic next time I see you. Okay, so fast forward a couple hours, I did head to the hardware store and I do have, I guess, nearly the final product. Um, picked myself a couple stainless steel M6 by 100 pitch bolts with washers that I could get my Juin Tech GTs on there. Um, like I said, I did have to cut some longer brake housing. I like to use that Jaguar uh, compressionless housing for these hybrid cable actuated hydraulic brakes. Um, it was kind of tough to route the housing just around the side of the brake, but it doesn't seem to interfere at all. And I just had to get it out into the neighborhood to get my initial impressions. So most important thing first, you know, how does it look? I think it looks like the Batmobile. I mean, I think it fits with the aesthetic of the bike. Definitely polarizing. I could understand why you wouldn't want to do it. Um, just getting on the bike, you know, straddling the top tube, I could tell how much that additional, you know, 15 millimeters or so of axle to crown has lifted the front of the bike. So that plus the fact that I'm running these spacers now means that my handlebars are, I don't know, a good two centimeters higher than they were before. Um, the bike's kind of uphill right now, which honestly places the drops in a really comfortable position. It's kind of set up like a dirt dropper right now. So I think for these gravel grinders that involve a single track, I might keep it like that, even though this would not be optimal or even preferred for me uh, for more of just the road gravel based stages. The other thing that I noticed, and I think this is a combination of maybe having that taller front end. So again, a little bit more trail. The bike is a little slower to turn in for sure. It almost felt like it had a gyroscopic effect. It's not a lack of lateral stability. It just feels like it's a little less willing to turn in. I think with the bars lower, I think with my 60, 650B uh, wheel set and just getting used to it, that's gonna feel different though. So I think what you end up with is a bike that's a little bit worse at cyclocross, but a little bit better at gravel. So thanks for watching today, guys. That's hardly an exhaustive review, but we'll be talking plenty about that fork uh, during the gravel race series, during the events. I'll see how it actually works out uh, when it comes to wartime. I have one other gravel optimization video coming for you. One more thing that I plan to do that's going to get this bike feeling a little bit more single track ready when it comes to the Athens Gravel Challenge, which is the fourth in the Ohio Gravel Race Series. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you in the next one. One important distinction is that these are glass fiber leaf springs. They are not carbon fiber. You're looking for an optical 